The Abraham Accords were a major accomplishment for the Trump administration in the Middle East. Now those agreements could be facing serious challenges because of President Biden's foreign policy. The White House team has some different plans for the Middle East. And as Chris Mitchell reports from Jerusalem, they could weaken the United States standing in the region and help countries like Russia. When President Biden came to visit both Israel and Saudi Arabia, things began to change in the region as agreements for mutual defense between Israel and neighboring Arab countries began to fall apart. The security architecture, publicly at least, unraveled. Uh, it was canceled, and the UAE instead uh, is now trying to reestablish diplomatic relations with Iran, uh, as are some of the other countries. So it seems that they measured the United States' commitment to confronting Iran up, measured it as too weak, and are trying to come to some terms with the Iranians. Middle East expert David Wormser says the unwillingness of the Biden administration to present a credible military threat towards Iran puts the Sunni Gulf countries in a vulnerable position. Because alone, they really can't stop the Iranians. They can't defend themselves effectively against the Iranians. So they only have one or two choices. One choice is to try to grovel in front of the Iranians, which is the path they're beginning to show uh, some sign of. The second path is to find a new strong horse, a new patron of power that can help defend them. In addition to the defense concerns, the Biden administration is also making a change to the Abraham Accords by reintroducing the Oslo framework for Middle East peace talks, by bringing in Jordan, Qatar, and the Palestinian Authority. But other countries don't support that idea. The uh, Saudis, the others, the other Arabs, they do not like the PLO. They do not like what they're doing. Uh, to, in, in various areas. So by forcing that back in, it actually threatened the Abraham Accords. Again, fortunately, I think the overriding interests of the countries are so strong that the Abraham Accords will, will survive, but it will not be with U.S. coordination. Former Special Envoy for the Abraham Accords, Arie Lightstone, says these Gulf countries are frustrated. And there is a feeling of, what are we going to do for the next 26 months? Lightstone says if the U.S. doesn't lead, other nations are waiting to take over. There is no coincidence that Putin showed up to Iran just as Biden left the region. There is a competition here. If the U.S. doesn't lead, Russia or China will. It's absolutely in our interest to lead. And those countries want to be led by us. They want to follow with us. They want to stand next to us. Mm. They don't want to sit next to Putin. They don't want to sit next to the Chinese. They, they're not interested in that. But if we're not there... The Russians and the Chinese are. Well, Chris Mitchell is joining us now from Jerusalem. So, Chris, there's a concept in the Middle East about the strong horse. How does it apply to what we're seeing now? Well, the whole idea about uh, the strong horse, Gordon, is that it applies to really how things work in the Middle East. The nations, they'll follow the strong horse. Now, to be the strong horse, you not only have to show that you are powerful, but you also, also have to show you're willing to use that power. Now, nations can either follow the strong horse for their protection, like some of these Sunni Arab nations, or because uh, the U.S. has the power, or they fear the strong horse because it will use its power. So here in the region, this is how it's working now, Gordon. It's clear that the U.S. has the power, but it's really unclear to many in this region, like Israel and these Sunni Gulf states, that the U.S. will use its power. So, in effect, the question they're asking, will the U.S. be the strong horse? So some nations are already answering that question with their actions. That's making nations like the UAE, Saudi Arabia, sort of shrinking back to protect their own interests. That's why the UAE is trying to uh, <clears throat> reestablish diplomatic relations with Iran, since they're not sure if the U.S. is going to back them up. It's also making Israel making statements like they'll have to go it alone if they have to, just sort of like the uh, IDF chief of staff said last week. So on, on the other hand, it's making nations like Iran, because the U.S. may not be the strong horse in the region bolder because they don't think the U.S. will use its power to stop them. I don't understand why the Biden administration would try to change the framework for the Abraham Accords. We finally had something that was working, that was bringing peace to the Middle East, bringing peace to the, the region. Why in the world would they change the framework? 
Well, I think, Gord, it goes back to what we talked about even uh, last week. The Biden administration seems to be going back to this whole concept of a two-state solution and wanting to include the Palestinians. Now, bringing the Palestinians into the Abraham Accords in the minds of some, like we talked to uh, earlier today, would be reversing the achievements of the Trump administration and the Abraham Accords. And the reason why, the Palestinian Authority sees the Abraham Accords as a threat. And so they want to undermine the accords. So the Abraham Accords, uh, in, in effect, took away the Palestinian veto for more than 20 years. I'm sure you remember former Secretary of State John Kerry said in December 2016 that be no Arab country would make peace with Israel unless the Israeli-Palestinian conflict would be solved. The Abraham Accords proved him wrong. Now the Biden administration seems to be going back to that whole concept of a two-state solution, bringing the Palestinians e even into the Abraham Accords. And as Ari Lightstone, who we talked to earlier today, he said that would throw a wet towel on the Abraham Accords. Well, it, it, what he did in saying, based on the 1967 borders, he has to know that's absolutely impossible. You can't have that. Israel could never accept it. And it... You know, the oddest thing is the Palestinians don't want a two-state solution. What they want is Israel off the map. So it, it, we finally had a, an administration willing to stand up to the Palestinians and say, no, you don't get to bully us. You don't get to have your way. You don't get to continue to preach this ideology. We're no longer going to continue to fund it. And it now seems like this giant reset. Um, it, it, is this sort of the U.S. foreign policy establishment reasserting themselves or, you know, what, what's behind the, the policy change? Well, I think a lot of people say it's the third term of the Obama administration, and uh, this was the policy of the, Bi of the Obama administration. Now the Biden administration, many of the same players in both administrations <coughs> uh, that, that are working right now with uh, President Biden to establish this foreign policy. And the whole idea basically uh, is simplified. They want to appease Iran. That's why they went back to the uh, negotiating with Iran over the Iran nuclear deal and going back to a two-state solution. That was an evidence last week when President Biden was here. He visited uh, eastern Jerusalem without an Israeli flag on the car. Uh, he, he talked about a two-state solution going back to the 1967 lines, uh, as you mentioned. So uh, that's what seems to be happening. The foreign policy that was there for eight years with Obama is now in the third term, as some people say, with President Biden. Well, let's talk about the meetings. Putin, Russia, uh, joining with Turkey, having meetings in Iran. Uh, it's, it's right out of the book of Ezekiel. You look at chapter 38 and you go, wow, I, you know, it, it, an alliance that's really unlikely is now coming together. So is there a possibility with war, uh, of war with Iran? And, and in that, is Israel really going to go it alone? Well, that's sort of the big question right now in the Middle East. It does seem more likely, not less, of a possibility of war. Uh, the reason for that is the U.S. is perceived as weak in the region. So while these nations are making their own decisions on their own national interests, uh, and Israel is saying they may have to go it alone. That's what the IDF chief of staff, Kohavi, said uh, just last Sunday, and that was following uh, President Biden's uh, trip. And so, uh, as uh, Ariel Lightstone said in our report, no coincidence that Putin is in Tehran just a few days right after President Biden. They're making the statement that they say they want to be the strong horse in the region and, uh, and they want to have bolder uh, policies there in the Middle East, more uh, relations with Iran and Turkey. And uh, as you said, uh, it does seem like a prophetic uh, perspective unfolding right now in the region. All the more reason that seems war is more likely. People need to be praying for the region and for the peace of Jerusalem. Well, Chris, thanks for the insight. And yes, indeed, people need to be praying for the peace of Jerusalem. Well, here at home, President Biden is working in isolation after contracting COVID-19. His staff says he's doing fine. However, there's still questions about how he got the disease. Brody Carter has that story. The White House is trying to show that most Americans can get COVID and recover without too much suffering and disruption if they've gotten their shots and tried to protect themselves. One major question that remains unanswered, where did the president contract COVID-19? 
He's had a busy travel itinerary as of late, including trips to Rhode Island, Massachusetts, and overseas to Israel and Saudi Arabia. When pressed on where the president contracted the virus, the White House said, quote, that doesn't matter. Where was he infected? I, I don't think we know. Um, I certainly don't know if you, if you have any thoughts I, on I, that. Look, I, I don't think that, that matters, right? I think what matters is we prepared for this moment. Thursday's White House press briefing was dominated by questions on the president's health after he contracted the virus. Hey, folks, guess you heard. This morning I tested positive for COVID. Officials say he's experiencing fatigue, a runny nose, and a dry cough, but say his chance for serious infection are dramatically reduced as the president is fully vaccinated and twice boosted. Mr. Biden was given an antiviral medication, Paxlovid, and he's expected to be isolated for at least five days while he works from the White House. Our expectation is that he's going to continue to, to have mild illness um, and he's going to be monitored for a symptom. Doctors say a major factor in the 79-year-old president's treatment is his age, and he will be closely watched. The White House has reduced the resident's staff to essential personnel only and plans to contact trace anyone the president has been in close touch with. Brody Carter, CBN News. Well, for more on this story, our CBN News medical reporter, Lori Johnson, is with us. So the president is in a high-risk category because of his age. How concerned should we be or should his doctors be? Uh, about his condition. Well, you know, his age is a very major concern. Age is the number one risk factor by far, and he's going to be 80 in November. You know, Gordon, out of all the people who have died from COVID, 81% have been over the age of 65. And, of course, he's well over that age. But, yeah, doctors really aren't that concerned about him. They say that he'll probably just continue to have these mild symptoms because he's fully vaccinated, twice boosted, and although the vaccines don't prevent us from getting sick, they're very effective at keeping us out of the hospital. He's on the Paxlovid, that's good. But really one of the major issues is that he has Omicron. And this Omicron variant that's been with us since January is a lot less severe than the other variants we saw, like Delta, because it tends to stay in the head or in the neck. So people have symptoms uh, like the president had, where you have a runny nose or uh, a headache, congestion, sore throat, but not that difficulty breathing, which is what we saw so often with other variants like Delta. So that's that's why so many people people are in pretty good shape like the president is there are so many so many things that mitigate uh, this virus but I should point out Gordon that still we're still seeing more than 400 people every single day in America die from COVID that's still far too many but compare that to the worst of the of this pandemic back in January of 2021 where 3300 people were dying every day. Okay. Well, tell us about the uh, medicine that our president is taking. Um, I believe it's called Paxlovid. It's an antiviral. How effective is it? And, and will that reduce his symptoms and, and lead to a quicker recovery? Well, Paxlovid is, uh, the best way to think about Paxlovid is to think about Tamiflu. So folks who are uh, familiar with Tamiflu, Tamiflu is to the flu what Paxlovid is to COVID-19. As you said, it's an antiviral. What that means is it stops the virus from replicating. When you're infected with a virus, it starts to multiply, multiply, multiply. So it's very effective. It's 90% effective at keeping unvaccinated, high-risk people out of the hospital. That's what the study showed. And uh, the key, though, to Paxlovid, like Tamiflu, is that you want to start taking it early. Ideally, you want to start taking it 24 to 48 hours after the onset of symptoms. Uh, so, Gordon, I know you are a he-man. You're kind of a macho man. So when you start having symptoms, you ignore them until you uh, can't function. So don't do that because the idea with antivirals like Paxlovid and also Tamiflu is you want to take them as soon as you start noticing those symptoms. All right. Well, I, I'll ignore the he-man. Uh, <laughs> Uh, let's let's get back to the vaccine. Um, under the new variant, it doesn't seem to be effective to actually stopping you from getting it. So should we still be looking at getting boosters? And is there going to be a new booster for the Omicron variant? 
Uh, yes and yes. So doctors say if you are over 50 years old and you haven't gotten your booster this calendar year in 2022, you need to get it. You need to get it right now because vaccines have been shown to be very effective at preventing severe disease and death. And also not only people who are 50 and older, but under 50 who have uh, medical issues like an immunocomprom they may be immune compromised. Uh, now the new Omicron specific vaccines are going to be introduced to the public in October or November. So these ones have been targeted specifically for the Omicron variant and the various sub variants that we've seen since January. Those will be out this fall. All right. Well, Laurie, thanks for the insight. Well, last month, Southern Baptists voted for reform, and it represented a watershed moment after two decades of stonewalling or ignoring victims. Heather Sells reports on how it transpired and what comes next. Three years ago, Jules Woodson and other Southern Baptist abuse survivors protested outside during the annual meeting believing that their presence and a bombshell Houston Chronicle report could encourage leaders to hear their concerns. I was hoping to feel some support. Dave Pittman, who suffered as a boy at the hands of his music minister, remembers the mistreatment by those attending the meeting, known as messengers. The vitriol, the words that survivors were called by messengers walking into the convention. Fast forward to 2022 and significant change. Not only did Woodson find herself posing with the new Southern Baptist president, the denomination publicly lamented a second scathing report showing how top leaders ignored or stonewalled victims for 20 years. This is our gut punch because we didn't want to see what we saw. This time around, survivors were also welcomed and provided with a recovery room stocked with refreshments. The messengers formally asked Woodson, Pittman, and eight other survivors for forgiveness, agreed to create a database for tracking predators, and committed to seeking further reforms. For survivors, hugs and tears to see the progress. Now there's action. There's something tangible survivors can cling to and, and say they are doing something now. It's such a freeing feeling to think that maybe we can begin to do the work that we've always wanted to do, which is to be able to hold abusers to account, to be able to keep them from moving from church to church and keep people safe. The world has watched Southern Baptists here in Anaheim grapple with and move forward on historic abuse reform. But leaders and advocates say this work is just beginning. It's time for Southern Baptists to realize how nimble and resilient our Baptist polity can be. Newly elected President Bart Barber has vowed to turn the tables and make abusers the ones who feel unwelcome. It starts with a new task force that will oversee the database, consider a survivor memorial, and an ongoing care fund. Pittman says it is key for those who've been violated by their pastor. The very least that the SBC could do would be to create a fund to be able to help them get them back on their feet because they would not be in that situation had a minister of the Southern Baptist Convention molested and raped them and destroyed their lives. Pastor Todd Benkert has long called for abuse reform. I think the real crisis for us is how we've responded when abuse does happen. The challenge he sees now is reaching the grassroots. We have state conventions, local associations, local church, every single uh, layer of that has different things that we need to do to address uh, this issue. Other pastors like Javier Chavez with the Conservative Baptist Network are asking tough questions, worried, for instance, that the database could smear an innocent pastor. Let's not make also this a denominational political witch, uh, witch hunt, which is very common in scenarios like that. The Sexual Abuse Task Force says only those credibly accused by confessing, receiving a legal conviction or civil judgment will be named in the database. For now, advocates say they want to see how it all plays out and will continue to support other survivors. The cost is so great and it's something, you know, a lot of people don't realize, but 
I do this because I don't want anyone to ever have to go through the trauma, the pain, the heartbreak, the destruction that became my life after my abuse. Reporting in Anaheim, California, Heather Sells, CBN News. I certainly applaud the convention for taking the strong steps that were needed to be taken uh, to create this kind of data, database, to make sure it never happens again, to apologize to the victims, to say, yes, we were wrong, uh, and we can certainly do a whole lot better, and then saying, well, let's go out and do a whole lot better. So congratulations for the reformation. Terry? There's a reason they call it the Widowmaker. Nine out of 10 people who suffer this kind of heart attack don't make it to the hospital alive. So when Jeff collapsed while playing basketball, the odds were already stacked against him. When a nurse on the scene first saw him, she thought he was already dead. When they came and got me, they said, is there medical personnel? And I said, well, I'm a nurse. His face was purple and I thought, oh dear God, he's dead. On July 7, 2021, Jeff Ratanapool woke up early and headed to the gym. For Jeff, Wednesday mornings meant basketball with friends. However, the usual routine quickly took a turn. After playing a game, Jeff fell to the ground unconscious. His friends called for help. Hillary Deskins, a retired nurse, was working out nearby when she heard the call. He had no pulse and he had no breaths. And I knew he was clinically dead. I started trying to do chest compressions and he was so, so large and so bulky and I could not compress his chest. I could not push down as hard as I, as I should have been able to. Soon Hillary was helped by one of Jeff's friends as another called 911. And I showed him right where to put his hands and how to interlace his fingers and use the heel. And I said, just push down as hard as you can. And I remember saying, trying to try to break a rib and he said break a rib i said break her. i said he's dead anyway the compressions were unsuccessful someone brought hillary a defibrillator i just hit the button and then he started making these what we call agonal he was all of a sudden he was breathing hillary asked everyone to pray as jeff remained unconscious and it was that, it was, oh God, please, oh God, please. I don't even know what I'm asking for, but please, God, please. Jeff's friends continued to pray as EMS arrived on the scene. He was taken by ambulance to Baptist Hospital in Louisville, where cardiologist Greg Merriweather confirmed Jeff had suffered a Widowmaker heart attack. Studies show Widowmakers are fatal nearly nine out of 10 times outside of a hospital environment. Typically the Widowmaker, when you refer to that, is what's called a proximal left anterior descending or LAD um, blockage. And that's in the front part of the artery. Uh, and because it supplies so much muscle uh, of the heart, it's a, uh, it can be a bad thing to have. Time is brain uh, function. And if you don't get high quality CPR pretty quickly after a cardiac arrest or get resuscitated pretty quickly after a cardiac arrest, uh, with each minute that passes, your chance of survival and your chance of surviving with intact brain function goes down uh, enormously. Jeff's wife, Vicki, was quickly notified. Their pastor, Stephen Fraser, remembers that morning. Vicki was really upset, really hysterical. As soon as I heard it, and I heard her voice, because my wife had it on speakerphone, just faith just rose up on the inside of me. And I just said, Jeff's not going anywhere. Pastor Stephen drove to the hospital praying the entire way, not with fear, rather with hope. And I was declaring things like that, declaring the promises of God, and then just found myself just praying in the spirit, really singing in the spirit, and just rejoicing. And I was just thanking God for him and just, you know, praising God all the way to the hospital. Upon arrival, Pastor Stephen found that his prayers had been answered. Jeff was conscious and alert. It was like, Nothing had happened to him. He was just sitting in the bed, completely normal, and just being his jolly self, really just kidding around and, and acting like his biggest concern was if he made the last shot of his uh, basketball, you know. My first thought was I looked over, I saw my wife, 
I saw my pastor, I saw the nurse and the doctor walked in and I remember in my head, I was thinking, oh, this isn't good. I didn't react like, oh my gosh, I had a heart attack. I remember thinking to myself, man, I feel pretty good for after having a heart attack. If this had happened almost anywhere else, I think he would have died. His chances of being alive and being alive with uh, his full brain capacity and, 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 and mental faculties would be very, very low. So I think it's a miracle and definitely a miracle in that sense. Without a doubt, he shouldn't be here. It, he was, um, he was dead. It had nothing to do really with anything we did. God saw fit to bring him back and it was 100% God, 100%. Yeah, I mean, it was just totally a miracle. Jeff made a full recovery and is even back to playing basketball Wednesday mornings at the church. He and Vicki are thankful he's been given more time and gives all the credit to God for saving his life. The time I've spent reflecting on it, it's just brought me closer to God. You know, when people gather in Jesus' name, he's there. And so seeing the power of that prayer of people coming together, going and lifting me up in front of Jesus and God and saying, you know, please, please take care of our brother. It, it means the world to me. But from that day, you know, after he has performed that miracle for me, that I go forward in life now, sometimes, you know, when trials and tribulations hit, I, I jokingly say to him, I can't wait to see how you're gonna take care of this one, Lord. And um, he'll always be there for me. He'll always be there for you too. One of the names of God is healer. He is the Lord, our healer. And that certainly was true in Jeff's case, wasn't it? Today, we know that there are many of you who are struggling with a variety of things in your life. Maybe it's not physical like it was for Jeff. It could be financial, it could be emotional, it could be relational, but God hears and knows your need. And he is with us now, he's with us always. But he invites us to petition him with the things that affect us, that concern us that impact our lives. And so we wanna do that together with you today. But first, to further build your faith, here's some other answers to prayer. This is Bridget. She lives in Pompano Beach, Florida. She lived with chronic pain in her left foot. 10 years ago, a very large man stepped on her foot and broke several of the small bones on the top of her foot. Since then, she's con confessed Isaiah 52, 7 over herself. Blessed are the feet of those who bring good news since she is in full-time ministry. While watching the show on June the 6th, Gordon said that someone was being, quote, healed of tiny bones, particularly on their left foot, and that they would feel a tingling. Bridget immediately did feel a tingling. The pain left. She could apply pressure to her foot without pain. She is praising the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Here's Sharon from Rocky Mount, North Carolina, experiencing hair loss at an alarming rate. Watching this show, Terry said someone else, you have a condition. You're not losing all of your hair, but spots of hair where you almost have bald spots on your head. God is healing that and your hair will grow. A lot of people want to get that word. Convinced it was a word of knowledge from God, Sharon claimed her healing. Over the next several months, she was thrilled to see her hair growing again. Now, that's a miracle. I love what he said. He said, I'm going to see what you will do next. Isn't that wonderful? When trouble comes now, I'm going to see what you are going to do next. Have that heart, have that prayer, have that thought. If you're in trouble right now, if you're having disease right now, if you're in pain right now, just realize, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. I'm going to walk it through with you, and I'm going to see what's next. We all know what's coming next. Your breakthrough, your healing, your dawn. All you have to do is hold his hand and hold on, and you can get the same thing. You just saw a wonderful miracle. You just heard two more miracles that have happened. What about you? Could it happen to you? And the answer is yes. Let's believe. Let's expect a miracle. Let's ask for it and then let's receive it. Pray with us. 
Lord God Almighty, we come to you. We come declaring your mercy, your covenant with us, the new covenant that was made with your blood. You made this covenant with us before we were even born, and we walk in agreement with it that by your blood, all our sins are forgiven. By your stripes, all our diseases are healed. For anyone with infirmity, for anyone suffering with pain, for anyone with disease, Lord, stretch forth your hand and heal. For we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. There's someone you're suffering with blinding headaches and it's because of a recurring tumor in your brain. Uh, you've already had radiation treatments for it and you've been really dismayed that somehow or other it's come back. In Jesus' name, be healed. May God remove it now, dissolve it, and may it never recur. May it never happen again. That headache just left you now, in Jesus' name. You're now healed and restored. Go back and get retested and declare the glory of the Lord. You shall not die, but live in Jesus' name. Terry? There's someone, you're a, um, <clears throat> a horsewoman. You love to ride. You even compete. You've had a, an unexpected spill, and it's damaged your spine. Now, now you're afraid to ride. God's healing that for you right now. You're just going to feel like a warmth come up and down your back as everything is put back in place. Anything that's out of place, now where it's supposed to be, complete and total restoration for you in Jesus' name. Um, there's, a, there's a woman, you're not even praying for it. Uh, you, you've, you suffered from uh, abuse from your husband and something happened to the left cheek. You're not even praying for it. Just take that left hand, touch it right now in Jesus' name. Be healed. Be restored. May all that trauma be broken off of you. May you walk into the glorious light that he has for you, the glorious destiny that all of that trauma gone. Walk in newness of life, righteousness, peace, and joy are you, are yours in him. Just receive it now in Jesus' name. Yes, someone else, a chronic sinus infection, might be more than one person. Just It just started out as a common cold, but now it's out of hand. God's healing that for you. All those sinus headaches, the pressure in your head, the drainage, it's all gone in Jesus' name. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for all that you do for us, all that you are. Be with us now, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you've been healed, let us know. Let us share in your good report. Give us a call. 1-800-700-7000. If you need prayer, we're here for you 24 hours a day. We believe in the prayer that gets an answer, the prayer that doesn't give up. And if you want prayer, all you have to do is call us. 1-800-700-7000. Welcome back to the 700 Club. Mega church pastor John Gray publicly praised God in an Instagram post after he was released from the hospital where he was being treated for a life-threatening saddle pulmonary embolism and blood clots in his lungs. He says, quote, the devil wanted me to die in this bed. This bed, this bed was supposed to be my end, but God, glory, hallelujah. Pastor Gray also thanked the medical staff saying, Thank you. Because of prayer and an amazing medical team, I am on a course for a complete recovery. We are so happy about this. You can find the full story on CBNNews.com. Well, CBN's Operation Blessing is helping Ukrainians during Russia's war on their country. Svetlana and her family spent the night in the basement when bombs hit their city. And in the morning, they found their apartment was destroyed. But through an Operation Blessing shelter partner, her family found refu refuge in Lviv complete with washers and dryers. OB also gave Svetlana the tools she needs to earn a living again, doing what she did before the war, giving manicures to women and providing for her children. And you can find out more about Operation Blessing by visiting OB.org. 
student loans, credit card debt, and a car loan. Added together, Jamie and Jenna were $100,000 in the hole. So Jenna prayed about it, and God gave her an unbelievable promise. Jamie and Jenna were crazy in love and horribly in debt. As they were planning their future together, the couple took a cold, hard look at their finances. Total uh, combined like student loans, and we both had a little bit of credit card debt at a, like, a car loan out too. Uh, it was right around $100,000. The two were both working as part-time teaching assistants. Neither jobs paid more than 20000 a year. And I remember, again, both of us, like, almost laughing at the mountain of debt that we knew that we were under. Unsure of what to do next, Jenna prayed about the debt and the future marriage. She says that's when God made her an unbelievable promise, one that she immediately shared with her fiancé. Jesus is now saying, like, us as a couple are going to be debt-free in five years. It was like one of those, like, you've got to be kidding. Like, there's no way that that's possible. The couple mapped out a plan to pay off their debt. They created a budget based on their limited income. They also decided their first expense would be tithing. I knew that it was something that would honor God and he, something he calls us to do. When I heard the idea of tithing would be 10% of your income, like, I did a quick math calculation, and I'm like, that's a lot of money every month. A few months before their wedding, both Jamie and Jenna were offered full-time teaching positions. But with just a few weeks to go before the big day, bad news. Their school hadn't been taking out the state-mandated retirement deduction. To make up for the shortfall, both Jamie and Jenna had their paychecks slashed. They were literally taking half of each of our salary every paycheck for the next six pay periods. It felt like it got punched, like we had been working so hard. Now the two would have to make do with even less than they had planned. The couple went on with the wedding and despite their limited income, held on to their promise from God and stuck with their plan to tie. For the first year or two, we struggled with the idea of being so restricted and sacrificing things and not being able to do the things that we saw our friends and family and community doing. Jamie and Jenna picked up side jobs along the way and continued to tithe off of what they earned. And they credit that for helping them get through those lean months. 12 weeks ago, they, we had half a paycheck. 12 weeks later, you know, fast forward, we got through that stressor and we didn't have to dip into our savings at all. I think continually being uh, humble enough to say yes to Jesus, that he has more plans and bigger plans for us than we could ever dream for ourselves, I think is a big part of um, what tithing is and how Jesus can really transform your life. The two continued to chip away at their debt. The school stopped garnishing their wages, and they even earned pay raises. Their daughter was born in 2017. Then, in January of 2019, shortly before they celebrated their fifth anniversary, Jamie and Jenna paid off the last of their $100,000 debt, just as God had promised. I wouldn't have believed it possible to pay off $100,000 of debt in five years, but we said yes to Jesus. To Jesus, one plus one equals whatever he wants it to. Today, Jamie and Jenna are still teaching. They own a home, and they've also started a financial blog where they tell the world about how tithing put them on the road to financial freedom. If we hadn't committed to tithing and made that a non-negotiable in our lives in our budget, that our budget wouldn't work. Looking from the time we started to where we are now, $100,000 in five years on teaching salary, we could not have done it without Jesus providing. And he'll provide for you. All he's looking for is to you, for you to say yes. His promise, you find it in the Gospel of Luke, 6th chapter, give, and it will be given unto you. You put it in motion. You say, okay, I'll give, and then it will be given unto you. Not just given a little bit. It'll be heaped up, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be poured into your lap. And here's the key, for with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. When you tithe, when you say, I'm committing my first fruits, that 10% at the top, when you tithe, wonderful things can happen. It's amazing how God wants to provide for his children.
And it's amazing how he uses unusual things to do it. Here are two teachers living on teacher salaries, and God makes it possible for them to get completely out of debt. Wonderful things happen when you say, yes, I'll give. Don't do it in expecting the return. Give because you want to, because you're cheerful about it, because you want to be generous, because that's how God is. He's so generous. He so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. When we become givers, we become just like him. If you want to start a life of giving, this isn't a one-time thing. It certainly isn't an on and off again thing. If you want to make a commitment, give us a call and say, yes, I want to be a CBM partner. How much is that? It's just $20 a month. That's 65 cents a day. Call us now, 1-800-700-7000. When you call and join, I've got something for you. It's my father's latest teaching on the book of Ephesians, Putting on the Armor of God. I want you to have it. It's yours when you become a CBN partner at $20 a month. Call us now or go to CBN.com. Either way, 1-800-700-7000. Terry? Well, we love to hear from you. Many of you read us on Facebook, and we'd like to take some time to answer some of the questions that you've sent in. Gordon, this first one comes from Pam, who says, if you believe in the Lord, but don't read the Bible and don't go to church, will you still go to heaven? All who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It's not based on works. Uh, you don't work for sa your salvation. What you just described about, you know, am I reading the Bible enough? Am I going to church enough? It's all oriented towards work. Is going to church good? Yes. Uh, and it's good for you, and it's good to have fellowship. Yes. Is reading the Bible good? Yes. It, you wash yourself in the Word. It renews your mind. It calls you uh, into account, but it also inspires you to do even more, uh, to say, uh, with God, all things are possible. But the basic of salvation, Jesus died for you. If you believe in your heart that he died for you, that he is the Lord Jesus Christ, the promised Messiah, you believe that he was raised from the dead. If you believe that with your heart, confess with your mouth, you shall be saved. It's that easy. This is Nancy who says, I know that I'm saved. When I have a spirit body in heaven, will I be called Nancy, which is my name now? Uh, Nancy, <laughs> I, I'm kind of wondering, you know, it, it, it's not big on my concerns, but, uh, you know, maybe you get called whatever you want to get called. I do know God has a, a tendency to re rename people. Abram became Abraham. Uh, Simon became Peter. Saul became Paul. Jacob became Israel. Um, you know, he even had some so cute names for his disciples. He called some of them the sons of thunder. Um, so it, 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 if, if God wants to rename me, be my guest. <laughs> and, you know, if I'm in heaven, you can say, hey, you, and, and I'll be okay with that. So uh, it, it, it might be up to you. Uh, it might be up to God. And I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> okay. This is Lavana who says, would you explain what the word glory means? The Bible talks about God's glory, the glory of the Son of God, and even our glory. But what does glory mean? Uh, glory means the, the evidence of God, the, the unmistakable evidence of God. It can also mean the transfiguration. So uh, Jesus talking to one of the sisters of Lazarus. Did I not tell you if you believed you would see the glory of, of God? He was talking specifically the, the evidence of the glory would be the resurrection of her brother. So the signs are evidence of the glory. At the same time, you have the Mount of Transfiguration where Jesus was transformed and with him was Elijah and with him was Moses in their glory and the disciples were awestruck by it. Um, Paul saw the glory of Jesus on the road to Damascus. He had a wonderful experience. It struck him blind. So think of it this way. How do you describe a sunrise to the blind? Uh, it's, you can talk about the colors. You can talk about the heat. You can talk about all the wonderful things the sunlight does for plants and how it warms the whole earth. Um, but can you really describe it 
And the answer is no. When you have this experience, it's unforgettable. Uh, anyone who has had a vision of the Lord, it's un, 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 undescribable because most people don't have that experience. And how do you explain it to them? So anticipate it, expect it, and one day you'll see it. Krista wants to know, how do I hear from the Lord the way you and Terry do? Ask for it. <laughs> True. You know, uh, it, it's, get, it's that simple. Um, Jesus said it very plainly. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be open to you. Uh, when you ask for more of the Holy Spirit, uh, it pleases God and he wants to. For me, in doing a lot of different uh, training on how to activate the, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, one of the hardest things to do is to explain to people, you already have it. Um, my sheep hear my voice. These are the words of Jesus. So that still small voice that is with you, that is in you, that is in your innermost being, that is the voice of the Lord. And when you ask him, questions. What do you want to heal today? Who do you want to heal? Uh, could you use me? Uh, could you use me to give a word? How can I give a word of comfort, encouragement, exhortation to the person I'm next to? Uh, you know, what are your, what are one of your thoughts towards me? These are just wonderful questions to ask. So ask, uh, seek, knock, it will be given to you. Here's a word from Psalms 20. In times of trouble, may the Lord answer your cry. May the name of the God of Jacob keep you safe from all harm. God bless. We'll see you next week.